I'm really excited to be here. I've been coming to Bangalore now since 2010, since Zynga opened its office here. And what really excites me about our Bangalore studio is, look, we've got 12 studios. But I want to talk about Bangalore today because the story of Bangalore is a lot like the story of what's happening in the startup scene in India now. Like a lot of American companies and Western companies, when we opened our office here, we did what? Infrastructure, ops, some customer service, and that's what we did here. But then something interesting happened. I was talking to the leader of our office here, and I said, hey, I've got some games, and I'm not sure where to send them. And he said, give them to me, and I will turn our cost center into a profit center for this company. And so we decided to take a shot at it. We had these, this entrepreneurial core in our India office, and we decided let's send them some games, even though they had never worked on a game before. Not a single member of the original team had worked on a game before. Fast forward five years. We have 250 person game studio in India. It's a game studio first. I think that there's maybe a dozen people that do infrastructure or ops projects. It is a game studio. And our game studio here is supporting some of the biggest games in the history of the Western world. They are running them. The leader of Farmville 2 sits in Bangalore. He has the P&L. He has total management of the game, total creative oversight. That is a story that, to me, I'm experiencing again here on the floors today. The startup scene, this conference, 5,000 people in its first year, I'm blown away. I've seen hundreds of uh, startups in my life, and I've seen another, and, and everyone I've seen here are working on fantastic things. And they're not doing just financial tech stuff or infrastructure stuff. The Indian startups are making social apps, games, dating apps, platforms for doctors to connect. I saw in the uh, startup pitch competition yesterday an amazing startup that made an incredible wheelchair that offered um, elderly and disabled people greater access and mobility than they have now. This is an amazing story. We're living in the greatest era of entrepreneurship in the history of humankind. All of us are. And it's a great time to be alive. And I also want to call, now, you know, sorry, I should have flashed these nice this nice slide up about our Zynga studio. So it's been five years and it's growing and for any of you who are looking for a new opportunity, we are hiring and we will give you real work to do and real responsibility, access to P&L and you can do amazing things. But let's get on with the show. I'm here to talk to both people who have an idea for a startup or in the process of raising money, and those of you who are actually on your way and you have a company, then you're up and running. So I've got two stories to tell. And the way that I work is I try and tell a story so that my kind of boring, boring ops lessons really bake in. So I want to tell you a story about a pirate ship from 1620. This ship's called the Vasa. So, the Vasa is in Stockholm, Sweden, where I went to talk to startups last year. Now, in 1620, if you were an entrepreneur, I mean the kind of entrepreneur like all of us are, the kind of people that work on things that are high risk and high reward, if that's the type of person you are now, if you were alive in 1620, you would have been a pirate, and you would have had, you would have had a boat. And the way it worked in 1620 is pretty similar to the way it works now. So back then, 1620, you would basically decide, I want to go do this. I have an idea of where there might be some treasure or maybe some other people that I could loot from, and I want to go and do this. So you would raise some starter capital from your friends and family, right? But in order to do that, you need to do what? Hire a team. So. The most important person that you would need in 1620 to get your startup going would be a shipbuilder. You need someone to build your ship. And you want to get somebody who's good, who's built ships before, or worked very closely with someone else who's built ships before, because this is going to matter. So imagine that you're the young captain of the Vasa. You've never actually been a CEO before, but you managed to get Jeff to be your shipbuilder. Wait, let me do this right. You get Shailesh to be your shipbuilder, okay? So you've got Shailesh, you're well on your way. Now, what else do you need? You need to know what direction to go. You need to hire 
somebody to help you out uh, with navigation, which would be like a marketing person or a head of product, right? So let's say that for my head of product, I hired DeepDee, and she's just fantastic. So now I've raised some capital, I've started to build my ship, and now it's time to go to the king. The king is like the VC, right? So I gotta go and I've gotta tell my story to the king and hopefully the king will fund me and then I can go. And interestingly, I think for you guys, the big denomination is the Crora, right? The Crora, their currency is the Krona. So you wanna go raise some Crora or Krona, then you go see the king. So you get to the king and it's a lot like pitching the VC. The king says, why should I fund you? And you say, well, I know exactly where the treasure is. And the king says, who are you? What ships have you ever commanded that have made money? And you say, me? I've, I've never been the captain of a ship, but I'm a, an expert on ships and the captaining process, and I know a lot of other captains, and you should take a chance on me because I'm really enthusiastic and I believe. And the captain goes, enough. Who's your shipbuilder? Oh, my shipbuilder. Well, that's the good news. I've got Shailesh. And Shailesh built this ship and that ship and that ship, and you've made a lot of money from Shailesh's other ships. And so King kind of goes like this on his big beard and says, okay, well, what about navigation? You know, you say you know, you say you know where you're going, but you've never actually done this. Oh, well, even better news, I've got Deepti. And you go, oh, Deepti, you've got Deepti. Okay, then here's what I'm gonna do. How much are you asking for? A million? I'm gonna give you five million. I'm gonna give you more than you're asking for. Now I'm excited, right? I mean, oh my God, they're gonna give me more money than I need? What could go wrong? Then guess what the king does? The king says, I have some conditions. The king says, you will fly my flag along with your flag. No problem, I don't care, flag, sure, king. You're the king, fly your flag, you're paying for it. Yeah, no problem. Great, there's more. I want this ship to be the best ship of any ship that I've ever commissioned. I want this elaborate bronze in the front. I want two rows of cannons. And not just any cannons, I want these big, heavy cannons. I want this ship to be the most fearsome ship that has ever flown my flag. Sound good? Yeah, that sounds awesome. Yeah, give it to me. So the king gets out his big feather and he takes out his feather, he dips it, and he signs his name and uh, they're funded, off to the races, right? So the captain goes back and he tells his crew, guess what guys, we're on. King uh, Augustus has funded us, yay. And everyone's like, yay, you're the best, yay. And then he pulls aside Shailash and he says, Shailash, here's the thing. Um, King wants two rows of guns. And Shailesh says, what? He says, yeah, we just got to add a second row of guns. Still got to get it launched by the spring, and we need a second row of guns. And Shailesh says, that's impossible. It's not possible. You need to tell him, no, we can't do it. And the captain says, no, no, no. It is possible. He gave us more money than we need. Just do it. And he says, right, but I can't do it because it's never been done. Our ship is already halfway built. I have no idea to do it. I have no one to ask how to do it. You need to tell him no. And he says, no, I don't need to tell him no. You need to figure it out. If I go and tell the king, he's going to cut off my head. So we're not going to do that. So you're going to figure it out. So, you know, Shailesh is like, all right, I guess I'll go try and figure it out. And so Construction continues, and they start recruiting. And guess what? The crew members on a pirate ship were between the ages of 20 and 24. And they all stayed in really tight quarters, and they ate all their meals together, and they basically earned very small money, but in the off chance that a wave didn't tip them over, or they didn't die, and they found treasure, they would get some of the treasure, but the king would get most of it. Sound familiar? It does, right? So. We're getting closer to the launch, and here's what happens. They're getting, they're like weeks away from the launch. They've got the crew, they're ready to go, and the navigator, Deepti, says to the captain, hey, captain, I think we have a problem, and they're in the bay. So 
The captain says, well, what is it? And she says, hey, you guys, just run across the horizontal side of the boat, okay? And she goes, run across the side of the boat. And the whole boat kind of goes like this. And the, and the captain says, well, what's the problem? And Deepti says, what do you mean what's the problem? The whole boat was just rocking backwards and forwards from just like five guys running across it. That's a problem. And the captain says, you're not the shipbuilder. What do you know? You don't know what you're talking about. You need to listen to the shipbuilder. We're going to be fine. Once we launch and there's plenty of water around us, we're going to be fine. We just need more water around us. So the big day comes. And the captain says, look, this isn't the real launch. We're just going to kind of do a little tour around the bay, and then we're going to come back. The king's going to be here. There's going to be a band. So even though it's normally people think of it as bad luck to bring women and children on a boat, it's not because we're not really launching. So bring your wives and children on the boat, and let's do this. So they launch the boat, and they're not even a mile from shore. And the captain says, what's the point of having two rows of guns if you don't shoot them? So... They open up the two, the two rows of doors on each side. Now there's double the number of, ho of holes in the side of the boat that there has ever been on a boat up until this date. And they push the cannons out, these big heavy cannons, and they fire the cannons. And then the whole boat goes boink like this in the water and it sinks. The top of the mast standing up at the top, almost everybody dying except for those who could swim really well in some very cold water. They had an inquest at the end of the inquest because they had to find out what happened. How could this have happened to the Vasa? And guess who they blamed? Any ideas? They blamed Shailesh. They blamed Shailesh. They blamed the shipbuilder. And so the reason why I tell this story is because I feel like there are lessons for all of you. You know, what are the lessons? Well, pick a great team. Listen to your great team. Not all capital is smart capital. Not all VCs are great VCs. You need to make sure that you and your VC are aligned. The right VC for you is not a person who you're worried about cutting your head off. The right VC for you is the person who you can call and say, I really need your advice. I'm facing a problem today, and I don't know how to solve it. Any advice? That friend, that person who's been in the trenches themselves before or knows what it's like, who, who you can talk to, other references that they've invested in, and they vouch for this person, that's the money you want. Beware of the person who tries to overfund you because there are consequences later and you need to know what those are. So that's my story for those of you who are about to raise or in the process of raising money. Now, I've got another story and it's about how to operate your current business. So I do operations and operations isn't particularly sexy work, but I really like it. And I have a, I have a methodology that I use that I want to share with you. So when I was a little kid, when I was in the second grade, I looked like that. I was kind of oversized even then. I went to the zoo with my class. I think that they do that in India too, right? Class trips to the zoo. And we were standing outside of the elephant enclosure. And we're watching the elephants. And then this, this is a guy, but it was a woman who's dressed like this. And she marches out into the elephant enclosure. And she puts on these big gloves. And she starts digging around in the elephant's shit, in the dung. She's on there on the ground, and she's running through it. And we're little kids, and we're like, we're losing it, right? I mean, she's putting it into these enormous test tubes, bigger test tubes than I ever knew existed that are designed to capture elephant dung. And, and we're freaking out. And the teacher waves her over. And she says to this woman, what are you doing? Why are you doing what you are doing? The teacher's name is Mrs. Brahms. And she says, well, you guys, I am a veterinarian. I am an elephant doctor, but I don't speak elephant. And the elephant doesn't speak English. And see, the only way that I can understand what's wrong with my elephants is if I dig through what falls out of the elephants, right? And people ask me what it's like to work on a turnaround, what it's like to work at Zynga right now. And what I'm doing is I'm digging in. I'm finding out what's not working, and I'm fixing it. And the way you can apply this kind of approach in your own work life is to look at any problem you have. Let's say that you're recruiting. Let's say that you didn't get a couple of candidates that you really needed, that you really wanted. Was the problem the offer? 
maybe, but what I found when I go digging around is that sometimes there's somebody in the interview loop who really shouldn't be in the interview loop, who doesn't take it seriously. Or I've got a junior engineer who's interviewing a very senior engineer. And the very senior engineer is thinking, oh, is this what I'm going to go join? Is this, uh, this is weird. I don't want to do that. So you have to go and dig in. Customer service is obvious. You need to be close to your customers to understand what's working and not working about your product. When I got back to Zynga, some of our games, you could get to customer service in three clicks. We had another game where it took 14 clicks to get to customer service. 14. I had to fix that. So it's only by digging in and looking at what's not working that you can find out how to optimize. Given where we all live right now, where the cost of acquiring a user is so high, you need to make sure that you have the best possible conversion. You've got to try different landing pages. We lull ourselves into being happy with a certain CAC because we read other blog posts and that just sort of seems like the CAC everybody has. Why in the world would we accept that? We need to be looking to continually optimize and make it better. You know, when we look at what our day 30 retention is, if you have a day 30 retention of 15%, you might be patting yourself on the back, right? Or 30%, shit, if you're 30%, you're a megastar company right now. But that means that at 15%, 85% of your players or your users, they're not, they're not active anymore. Well, what happened? Somewhere along the way, they dropped out. And you need to be curious, and you need to find out why. So I am over time, but I want to thank you all for coming, encourage you to keep on pushing, keep on going, and just continue to believe that if you want to create and you want to make, that you can and you will. You are part of a vast community now. Sitting in this room are hundreds of people, and in this hall, thousands of people just like you who want to create something new and bring something new to the world and redefine work and redefine life. So thank you very much. Have a great conference.